So now what we want to do is we want to take our weathered material from the continent that has been dissolved and transported by the river, and we want to take it through the estuary into the ocean. And what we're going to find is that during this process, we get a lot of changes in the chemical speciation of the elements. This process is involved in many of the elemental cycles that we have covered in this class. And so in the river water, we have a lot of different uh, dissolved species. We have a lot of organics, such as humic acids, fulvic acids, and we have a lot of inorganic material, things like trace elements and iron and aluminum, colloids, and a lot of these materials are complex ions or bound to organic ligands. And so we'll look at how trace metals are affected and also things like iron, which are actually a high concentration in rivers. And so what happens to these dissolved solids as they're transported to the ocean? So that will be what we cover in this lecture. So again, I just wanted to remind you of what humic acids look like. They, they play a role in this video and within the speciation of a lot of metals that are transported in the rivers. Fulvic acids, as I've mentioned before in a previous video, they're similar. They just don't bind metals as strongly as humic acids. And so let's do an example where we weather a rock and then that material is transported through the estuary and into the ocean. And so let's see what happens in this example using iron and how its speciation changes as it goes through this process. And so to start, we have olivine here. I mentioned in the first video of chapter nine that this mineral is easily weathered because it's in the form of iron two. And with rainwater and with subsequent oxidation, we get iron three to be formed within the river water. And so this iron three starts to travel downstream. And as it does so, it goes through an environment that is increasingly changing with respect to pH. So as more and more material is being collected, the pH is going up because it's be the water is becoming more buffered. You can imagine at the top of a mountain, which is very alpine and barren, there's not gonna be much buffering there. But as it continues to go through the forest and through other environments, these streams that feed the river will continue to um, add more buffering capacity to the water. Also, we could be getting photosynthesis to occur within the water, and that would also bring up the pH. So as the pH changes, this iron three begins to change its speciation. And so we could have written these reactions as hydrolysis reactions. And I say that for the chemists in the audience. But to simplify, we could also write them in terms of as we go more and more basic, we begin to have more and more hydroxide in solution such that we form these new species as the pH increases. And so again, the iron in terms of just inorganic interaction, we see a change in the speciation. And around pH seven, what we see is that this would be the point that iron would most likely precipitate out because it no longer has a charge and it would just, again, 
form um, rust and settle out to the bottom of the river or stream. However, iron-3 can also be associated with things like humic and fulvic acids and stay suspended. Remember that those humic acids would have a negative charge around their surface, and so they would be attracted to this cation, this iron-3. So this plot here, this kind of has all the information we need in terms of the inorganic speciation of iron within this river water as the pH continues to change. So here we have pH, and it's plotted as a log C. We've done these sorts of plots before. This one looks a little bit different. But nonetheless, what we see is that the speciation of iron changes with pH. And so at pH 3, we look up here, we're looking for what species is the most common or most abundant. And what we see is this intersection right here. It looks like at about pH 3, that's where iron 3, which below that pH was most abundant, we now see that this species here is the most abundant. And it's the most abundant until we get to about right here. At right here, it drops. But this species actually now, at pH 4, it becomes at the most abundant. And so that reaction occurs at around pH 4. And we can continue to follow these species and their presence until about right there, pH 7, it continues to drop. But now it's the iron 3 hydroxide that becomes the primary species until about pH 9, and then it will actually form a complex ion if we get a pH that high. So this plot, these intersections are very important. And again, we're reading off concentration in a log scale such that we need to be able to look at this plot and ask ourselves at any given pH, what species is more abundant and what reaction would be occurring at that pH. And so let's go through the estuary. The estuary is a very dynamic environment. This is one of the environments that I enjoy studying the most. I enjoy it because of how dynamic it is. However, it's extremely complicated at times. And so if we were to look at dissolved iron, so this is iron in that dissolved phase, if we were to watch and see what happens to it, what we see is that as it goes through the estuary, it drops in concentration. Essentially, all the dissolved iron just drops out into particles. So we're going from river water to ocean water. And the main difference between those is the salinity. So river water, fresh water has zero salinity. Ocean water, for nice purposes, we're going to say has a salinity of 34. This is in uh, parts per thousand. And so we can imagine in the middle of the estuary, we have a salinity of 17. So in the estuary, as we change salinity, what we find is that the dissolved iron is removed in the estuary and turns into particulate iron and drops to the, into the sediments. And what that gives us is a very low concentration of iron, of dissolved iron in the ocean. And this is a very important part of the ocean ecosystem. And so how does this happen? 
So this is an important part. I will definitely test you on this. So what's happening is the seawater, the ocean water, it contains within that salinity a lot of calcium and a lot of magnesium. And so when the river water is exposed to these ions, the humic acids and fulvic acids within these materials and any colloids, they're all negatively charged. So these humic acids and fulvic acids and colloids, their surface is full of negative charges. And that's why they carry things like iron with them. But when they hit the salinity of the seawater, the calcium magnesium end up neutralizing that charge. These positive cations, calcium and magnesium, they take up all those negatively charged sites and everything else ends up turning neutral. So all these different particles become neutral and once they become neutral, they start sticking together. They're no longer attracted to the water. Remember water is polar, right? Water likes things that have charges, but once these particles and humic acids no longer have charge, they begin to clump together, or what we would call coagulation in chemistry, or in a lot of environmental fields, we call flocculation. And so in that process of flocculation, we get the removal of a lot of the elements that were in the river water. So we would say that within the salinity gradient of the estuary, this is where we get the coagulation, flocculation of humic and fulvic acids, and we get the removal of a lot of the metals that were in the river water. And so this work was done in the 1970s, and what they found in these estuaries is that you know, about 95% of the iron is removed within the estuary. And a lot of these other metals are also removed, about 40% copper, nickel, manganese. Some are not affected hardly at all, such as cadmium. We'll talk about that later on. So, and so to conclude this example, Again, what we have here is dissolved iron in the river. As it goes through the estuary, it precipitously drops in concentration until it reaches the ocean where there's very little concentration of dissolved iron because it all turned into particulate iron. And this is occurring at the same time that the salinity is going up linearly. And so what I want to bring to this conversation is two new terms that we will continue to uh, discuss in the next few videos is the behavior of these concentrations. And we would say that dissolved iron is behaving in a non-conservative way because its change is not affected just by dilution alone. Salinity here is a straight line because it is behaving conservatively. Again, the only change here in terms of its concentration is due to the fact that it is being diluted by the river water. And so the last part of this video I want to talk a little bit more about conservative and non-conservative behavior with respect to elements. And so again, conservative behavior can be explained totally through dilution. However, these non-conservative behaviors, they are dictated by biological or geochemical processes and this is what creates what we consider non-ideal behavior.
And so we went through an example showing how iron in the estuary behaves non-ideally, non-conservatively. But what I'd also want to do is go through two more examples looking at barium and cadmium and how they behave in a non-conservative way. Before I go to the last slide, let's just look at silicic acid, which we talked about previously. Silicic acid through the estuary behaves conservatively, different than salinity, because its concentration is actually high in the river, but as it goes through the estuary, it gets diluted with seawater and its concentration lowers by dilution only. So in these last two examples, I just want to show you that not all elements behave like what we saw with iron. And so in these last two examples, what we're going to see is that cation exchange is a very important process within natural waters. And so what we see, say, for cadmium is that the concentration of the dissolved cadmium actually goes up in the estuary. And that's due to the fact that, say, cadmium that's associated with particles. And remember, these particles are all negatively charged when they're in the river that when they enter the estuary, what we get is calcium and magnesium to actually stick to those negative sites and exchange with the cadmium, such that the cadmium gets kicked off and goes into the dissolved phase, therefore its concentration goes up. And so in the case of cadmium, because of the presence of chloride, we actually form a complex ion. And so this is the chemical speciation of cadmium as it travels through the estuary. Barium is similar. It is also affected by cation exchange. And again, the calcium and magnesium replace the barium on the particles and barium goes in to solution. And it doesn't form a complex, and that's how it would differ from cadmium. But if we look at the behavior of cadmium and barium as it travels from the river to the ocean, what we find is that there's non-conservative behavior up until about salinity of 10. And so it's during this time that the cation exchange occurs. But we do not see any more non-ideal, non-conservative behavior after pH of 10. After that point, these elements start to behave conservatively, meaning that what we see in terms of their concentration is only due to conservative mixing and the dilution of that water as it approaches the ocean. So I wanted to bring up these examples just because they are different than iron. I do want you to understand from this video how the presence of humic acids, of calcium and magnesium, and how this whole interaction occurs within the estuary to change the speciation of the elements, and in doing so, affects the elemental cycling uh, that we see and observe.